You know, the thing I find madding, maddening about this whole situation is years ago when crypto was first a thing, when we first started talking about Bitcoin, I found it incredibly confusing to figure it all out. And normally, with everything else in life, the more you learn about it, the easier it becomes to understand. Not with crypto. No. It continues to become more and more confusing as all of these... I'm not, I was going to say insane people, but just these people <laughs> just like push it to all these new levels. I just don't, I just don't get it. And I never will get it. I will leave this planet confused. Hey everyone, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 40 of Bad Voltage. I hope you're all okay, wherever you may be hanging out today. Today I am joined by my wonderful compadres, Stuart Ian Langridge, and of course, Jeremy Durex Garcia. How's everyone, how are you guys doing today? (laughs) So clearly, one, you didn't think about it ahead of time, because that was the last sentence uttered before we actually started recording, but um, (laughs) just not not good, come on. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know little bit of insight into the behind the scenes process that, that, that makes bad voltage i i assure you listener you want zero insight here it was <laughs> not great. i was a very confused child that's all i'm gonna say um so <laughs> makes it even funnier. anyway uh so today we are going to be uh doing loads and loads of news um and we've got a lot to get through um there's been a lot going on recently um so what do you guys want to... Well, before we go on, of course, we should thank our friend, uh, Marius, uh, for all of the great work he does in editing the show. Um, of course, Marius runs NerdZoom Media. So for all of your video editing, audio production needs, go and check out NerdZoom Media. He's great. Um, but which one of you two Muppets wants to get started? <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't seem very kind. So I, was- I mean, which... Of- yeah, just which one of you great guys with amazing insight? Oh, well, well put. Well, I mean, I will start with one. Um, I read a thing about Spotify and Adele, which I thought was interesting. I've seen a bunch of people complaining that um, Spotify now do podcasts, right? I believe we're on it. Are we on it? Yeah, we are. We are. I hey. Add, add okay. It. Are you talking about Adele the musician or a Dell as in a single Dell computer? <laughs> so, a, a, a single all, Dell computer. I'm not, I'm not talking about a single Dell computer. <laughs> um, okay. But um, a bunch of people I have seen complaining about how Spotify's uh, front screen appears to be dominated by podcasts, even if you don't want it to be. Whatever, I don't really have an opinion. Don't particularly use Spotify. Whatever. No worries. Yep. But I've also seen people um, complain that they don't have a setting to turn it off. Now, in a sort of a mentally similar space, Adele doesn't seem to like the idea that... Um, when she plays an album, it might shuffle in the wrong order, in an order different from that which the artist chose. So she yeah. complained to Spotify, who have now taken away the ability to shuffle an album. Albums are now presented in the order that the artist wanted them to, whether you want that or not. Nothing was taken away, it's just the default now is to not shuffle. Okay, my understanding was that you now can't do it. You have to listen to an album in order, not shuffle. Jono opens Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this is why I'm asking. Um, because the reason I thought this was interesting is, first of all, I like the idea that instead of demanding a setting for a thing, you know, this goes back to Havoc Pennington saying you can't have settings for everything, you just get upstream to change it the way you want, and then you don't need a setting, <laughs> which sounds good. What's weird about that is the article you linked to then says, for those intent on listening to albums out of sync, though, shuffle can be used on individual album tracks and playlists. It says on individual album tracks. If you pick an album, you can't then shuffle it. So so it sounds like, yeah, you, 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 you select one album in the artist profile, you have to listen to them in order. But if you select an artist, like Iron Maiden, you can probably shuffle between different Iron Maiden songs, I'm guessing. Why would you shuffle an album anyway? Ah, well, you see, now, I was going to say it would be useful to go over to our um, up-themselves musician correspondent, but we don't have one of those. <laughs> so let's go over <laughs> instead to Jono and ask the question. Thank you. Is it incredibly pretentious of artists to demand that you listen to their work in the order they presented? Or is it okay to listen to some of their songs and not like half the album, which is filler? What do you think, Jono? 
My view on this is there's there's no doubt that when you're making an album, like it is in a certain order. It's it's intentionally designed that way. Yes. And often with some bands, especially like for example, progressive metal bands, you know, the songs are they're telling a story, like concept albums. They tell a story, right? And sometimes like some of the music will flow into the next track. So shuffle completely screws that up. Um, so which was roughly me, her made, point? I think what. Which is her point, which I, I, I agree with. Um, I, if they'd have removed the idea of shuffling in general, that would be annoying. Um, because sometimes you do want to just, sometimes I just want to stick Iron Maiden on and I don't particularly want to have to go through. I mean, I personally just listen to an album. I just put an album on because I, I prefer to listen to music that way, but a lot of people don't do that. So it seems reasonable what she did. You know, and she's, she's a uh, somewhat popular artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So, um, clearly, my yeah. my new my new plan when software doesn't work the way I want it to do is release an album named after my year, the year of age I am, and then just get upstream to change it so it works the way I want. Wicked, <laughs> right? I mean, it turns out that when people build software, the people who uh, use the software, uh, who provide feedback, the people who make the software, sometimes listen to those people and make changes. I got a stupid question for you. Do you think Adele listens to Spotify a lot? It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, everyone listens to Spotify. That's where the vast major- majority of people listen to music. You should see. I track all the stats <laughs> for my band, right? So and, okay. and when I put when I put the Baron Carter music out, I, I use this service called CD Baby. And they basically, they're a distributor. So they put it on all of the different platforms. Amazon, Apple, everything, right? And uh, you should see the difference in how much people listen to Spotify, which is like 98% of all music listening is on Spotify. Hmm. And then there's everything else. What's interesting that I've discovered is it's people in America specifically tend to use Apple. Well, so there's a couple of things, couple of thoughts I have there. The first one, yeah, America. Um, secondly, <laughs> um, without, without wishing, without wishing to be <laughs> mean here, Jono, um, I feel like someone saying, yeah, I put out my music digitally and I live in the Bay Area and everyone around me listens to Spotify doesn't seem <laughs> necessarily representative of the world, no. right? You see, you always do this. You always, you always take my opinion and drag it down a notch because <laughs> I live in the Bay Area. The, here's the thing, right? And I'm not going to, I obviously don't want to make this all about, bar- like my band is one band. No, but this is really interesting. This is why I'm asking the question. But, um. The top five countries that listen to Baron Carter are Argentina, Brazil, Spain, US, yeah. and there's one, I forget which, which was the other one, all on Spotify. Spotify is huge in South America. Is, but is it as huge as YouTube? That's the thing I'm not, I'm not sure about. I, I'm guessing it's not as big as YouTube. But then I don't understand why you're saying Spotify is at the top of the rankings. If they're leaving out YouTube. People, well, the YouTube have got YouTube music, and then there's general YouTube. Which, yeah, nobody uses YouTube music. <laughs> you, no, nobody uses YouTube music. Then you have like actual YouTube, but that's. I mean, no one really goes there to listen to music. I mean, some people do. So, according to uh, Statistica, share of music streaming subscribers worldwide in the first quarter of 2021, Spotify is by far in the lead, 32 percent. Google yeah. services are only at eight. Yeah, I th- I think people who are prepared to pay a subscription for access to music, Spotify is by miles the leader. I agree with you completely. Yeah, it's. I mean, it is a music fan's dream. Like you can, I literally everything that I want to listen to is is on there. Pretty much everything. There yeah. are some bands. There are some old back catalogs of artists that aren't on there, aren't on there, and they do a generally decent service. I feel like Spotify. Yeah, uh, and they're actually yeah, not too so. bad for artists as well. I mean, the payments are not good, but the the way they allow artists to interface with spotify is pretty good so okay yeah so um yeah so you know it's not just a, it's not just a bunch of tesla driving bay area fucking people language <laughs> coastal elites <laughs> you bigot coastal elites oh wow. all right what's next what should we talk you about? have that in the funny section but i don't get what was funny i, I do it. i'm not i do I, I do i'm not sure why i did <laughs> <laughs> let's do a serious one what about, uh, why don't you tell us about the uh, Apple self-repair thing? This, that's something we yeah, can so talk a, a about. Lot, <laughs> a lot of people seem to think this is big news, and I just don't think it's much of news at all. But um, So last Wednesday it was, uh, Apple announced that the company will soon make parts and repair manuals available to the general public, reversing years of res- 
restrictive repair policies. The new policy represents a seismic shift for a company that has fought independent repair for years by restricting access to parts, manuals, diagnostic tools, design products, uh, and uh, lobbied in general against laws that would enshrine the um, quote-unquote right to repair. So w- the one interesting thing here is I, I don't think that they just changed their – this policy out of the, the goodness of their heart. I, I believe it actually was announced on the day of a key deadline of a different, um, different, but someone uh, related shareholder resolution. So I, I think they are finally feeling a lot of pressure, uh, some from consumers, some from regulators, but um, I, already, obviously these, because the first thing I heard everyone keep saying is this must have been in the making for years. And I don't think it was because they already had all these manuals and products and repairs because there's authorized service shops and at the Apple store, you can get things repaired. So they already had this whole supply chain set up. I, the odds an average consumer is going to fix an iPhone by themselves is laughably small. So I think they did this for PR and NPR only. Which makes it not really news, but it was on the news all over the place. And I, I don't think anyone thinks it's news that um, you can now get this stuff repaired. And I, yes, I don't think individual people are going to do it, but I think you're going to see um, little third party shops, which already exist, will be less shady about the fact that they're doing it. But I think the reason everyone's talking about this is because this is Apple backing down on a we get to control everything decision. And we're starting to see that happen more and more. And I completely agree with you, Jeremy. This is, we're trying to get out ahead of this stuff so we don't get regulated into doing it. Uh, so I think the, the barn doors are open there. I think had they made some of these changes six, nine, maybe 12 months ago, they would have been fine. Their absolute reticence to make any changes at all and keep betting that they'd be able to do this is really going to work against them. That's going I think there's going to be some serious regulation over the next 18 months or so that will significantly impact Apple's revenue. You would almost think that um, acting like this tends to really piss regulators off who will then yeah. they, who will then unfairly react by over-regulating you. And I'm like, yeah, that's what happens. You made your bed. But their you inability you, you to you give an inch is going to cost ounce. them feet. Yeah, no, 100%. And they didn't. The thing is that consumers would have liked all the things. Like, consumers were clamoring for this, not regulators. And when I say this, I'm not talking about this specifically, but things like some of the App Store rules that are changing and in-app payments and, and all the other things that we've covered at length on the show over the last couple of months, why they didn't give a little bit on some of those just for developer goodwill, which they're already burning through at unbelievable velocity. I just will never understand. I mean, it it seems like the, the, this whole like right to repair thing. I can't see any, I can't, I can't see any argument for consumers against it. Right. Like there is so no argument as, against it. It's just like this this is by definition a good thing. The thing that I'm a bit confused by is people have been repairing screens for years. So I'm assuming screens are the easy bit, but in terms of the actual computer itself in the phone, I'm assuming that's what this is going to be primarily applied to. Like well, I say that, but I I mean I'm a brand new iPhone user for a year. But I I always, would always see ads for like oh you can go and replace the screens. I mean the, the um, only two things I hear about are screens and batteries. I, I the right, odds of someone right. ripping a chip off of one of these PCBs, I, I, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Seems unlikely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, to the extent that there are right to repair laws already, uh, there are mandates that um, equipment is able to be repaired because the idea is to drive down e-waste, right? Um, and I think the big problem with that is economic rather than um, people's lack of ability to repair your toaster. It's just if a new toaster costs 20 quid, or a new microwave costs 25 quid, taking it into an electrician and saying, can you look at this? If they spend, you know, if they charge, I don't know, what, 50 pounds an hour? It means if they spend more than half an hour completely fixing the problem, it is cheaper for you to throw it in the bin and buy something else. I I don't think that's fixable by saying you now have the right to repair this toaster. It's just not economic to do so. Yeah. But I don't know a way of solving that without mandating that all toasters now cost £400, which is no improvement. <laughs> so, um, but even the right to repair laws that currently exist uh, explicitly exclude, basically, computer equipment. They don't apply to laptops, smartphones, or tablets. So a lot of electrical equipment they do apply to, so uh, televisions and how, uh, household appliances and things like that. Um I think they 
were trying to stave off the idea of a, yeah, you're not allowed to open the lid on this culture moving into washing machines and so on. And, um, large, uh, white goods manufacturers insisting that now your local electrician wasn't allowed to fix your fridge freezer because they had to do it. Um, uh, and whether they didn't mandate this for laptops and smartphones because they bought the company's arguments that these things change over too fast and they're too tightly integrated and they're too user unserviceable or whether they just went we've already lost that battle so we're not going to bother trying to legislate is open to question but it does sound like they are pulling that back a bit because it's anti-competitive basically yeah and part of part of the issue with it is that if um it also hampers reverse engineering so it makes it difficult for people to build uh third party add-ons to to stuff. That's less of a problem now than it used to be because everything's USB C or whatever. But um eventually it this sort of thing does become a problem. It's it's it it does kind of open up this interesting new kind of world where, you know, of course like when we were growing up using computers, it was big bulky chips on circuit boards, and then when we got into the PC side of things, everything was modularized into ISA cards and and you know you could upgrade your processor and hard drive and all the rest of it which was really cool and obviously continues to be cool in the in the PC world but you know you look inside of a MacBook Pro and it's just basically a giant integrated board and especially now when you've got chips like the M1 where everything's on, on a single chip um even if Apple are going to be okay with this it's just the world is moving to these like just the modularization is gone, right? Uh, like it, you see, but um, the implication of that statement—I don't think it's your implication—but I think a lot of people who say that the implication is that's because that's a necessary component of our new, better technology is that it has to be built in this non-modular way, right? And I think the idea of things like pushing right to repair laws and so on is it could be built in a modular way, which allows people to switch stuff in. Just none of you are trying to do so because you've got no motive to do so. I mean, for phones, I don't think it can be. If you want a phone that small, that thin, that's also waterproof, modular is the one thing you probably realistically, from an engineering perspective, do have to give up. Google were talking about doing it. Yeah, but that one platform was huge. It was giant. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's because it was the first one that got built. Think about what the G1 looked like when it came out by comparison with your iPhone 13. Oh, I'm not I saying that someday different. you couldn't have a phone that resembles today's phones and keep all the good things and be modular. I just think today, the one thing you'd have to yeah. give up is size. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm not at all disagree with that, but no one has any motive to do it at all. Be- because if, if you push someone, if you push someone, to, if you push a company to say, do this, they'll go, but if we make it non-modular, then anyone who buys our thing is locked into it. Great. So we'll do that. But that, that's kind of where I'm getting at is, uh, to me, it's, it's an interesting incentives policy question, which is if you're Apple and you don't, like, if you pitulate to right to repair, so you provide manuals and whatever else that, that you need to go and repair existing devices, that's one thing. But if Apple has no interest in building a modular platform, right, because they just don't consider it a priority in terms of their business, right? So they're not stopping people trying to repair existing devices, but everything just becomes more more integrated. I mean, just look at modern ele- electric cars, <clears throat> modern devices, everything's an integrated circuit now. Why would, why would Apple, like, well, let me back up. Do we think Apple should be pushed into a modular system because you can enable, you can enable right for a bit. I don't know what I think about this. I think that's absolutely the question. I, and I don't think this is about that, but it's the question that we ought to be addressing big picture. Is the point of a right to repair law that what you have to do is you have to give people the right to repair the thing that exists to the extent that they will be able to? You, you don't have to make it repairable. You have to offer the ability for them to repair it, which yeah, is very That's a good way of describing things. it, yes. Jeremy. Yeah. But should you have to build repairable things that's not what this law is but maybe we're moving in a direction where we'd like that to be the law 10 years from now it's like you're not allowed because the goal of the thing is not just to give people the freedom to access their own devices although it is it's there's a big picture public policy goal as well right to try and reduce the amount of e-waste there is what's well, and being more environmentally friendly i think was part part of the shareholder resolution was more about being environmentally friendly than it was about some of the traditional right to repair motives 
And making a thing modular where if a thing on it breaks or if you want um, an updated version of that thing, you can just replace that bit and not the whole thing is by definition better. (laughs) So attempting to lean people or nudge companies in the direction of building more modulable, more modular, more swappable things is a good thing, right? Well, it's, uh, yeah, and it's one of those things where I think we'd all agree, like you just said, Act, that the, you've been able to easily f- switch out a battery in a phone, for example. <laughs> Which I haven't been able to do for 10 years, and it drives me crazy. Yeah, it's by definition a good thing. <laughs> um, where I can see it from a company's perspective is the more modular a system you make it, um, the more complex support becomes and customer support and th- uh, customer success and all that, all that kind of stuff. There's a balance in there somewhere. It wouldn't like, I think Apple, what they should do is they should make it easy to switch out the most common things that are going to degrade in a, in a phone, right? Like battery is the obvious one, right? But people crack their screens and it should be easy to be able to switch that out and they should offer products to do it. Like, I don't understand why Apple wouldn't say, as part of Apple Care or as part of even just in an Apple store where you can go in there and you can get the special eye battery and it performs better and all the rest of it. And the, you know, or I like to me, there's a, there's an opportunity. The only way in which like making them more repairable is going to work is if they make it attractive for companies to offer that from a business perspective, being right. pushed into it by policymakers. I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's the right thing to do, even if it's the right thing to do, like, the only the only caveat to that is the environmental is the environmental angle, yeah, right, which is which is compelling because there's shitloads of e waste down there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. really, and that's only contributed to by the fact that if a thing on your phone breaks, you have to spend fourteen hundred dollars to buy a new phone. But it's hard to make a compelling story for a company which isn't about that because they're like fourteen hundred more dollars rock and roll. So, <laughs> and I thought this was going to be a thirty second segment when I wrote this down. No, 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 no. This is this is a really interesting topic. I mean, um, according to I was reading the FT about this and replacing the back glass, so not the screen, the back glass on an out of warranty iPhone 13 Pro Max can cost six hundred dollars, half the price of a new one to replace the back glass. That's the thing. Like the market's not there, is it? Like you should be able to go and do that for thirty five dollars. Yeah, fifty dollars. <laughs> like it's 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 it is mad the e-waste thing c- c- really increasingly frustrates me yes. um i'll give you an example we uh there's a company called lucera i think it is and they um they make covid tests they're one of the first rapid covid tests that came out and they made them available to the general public about i don't know about three or four months ago so we bought a bunch of them they're just good to have in like we got back from a trip and one to COVID test before Jack went back to school and all the rest of it. And it's like, a, it's a device. You put batteries in it, you swab your nose and you plonk it in there and it tells you within 30 minutes, but they're single use. And it's like, why? why? <laughs> that means that you have to throw it away every single time. And the only thing we can do... So you don't have to send this kit out? I have not seen this. Yeah, you can buy them, the, you can buy them and, and it will show you in 30 minutes. Huh? But it's not chemical... It, it requires power and electronics. It does. I mean, I'm sure that the, the 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 detection of COVID is chemical, but the way in which it's rendered to the use to the I don't know how they work. Obviously, yeah. Um, that, and it's a really cool test. Like it, it, and it's a PCR test, so it's the highest quality of test. It's not an antigen test. But the thing that's frustrating is the only thing Eric and I can do to be responsible here is to take the batteries out. The rest of it has to be dumped into e waste. And oh, it's, it's sorry. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah. we're just taking the batteries out, dude. But you mean take the batteries yeah. out, throw the rest away, and keep the batteries, right? Okay. Yeah, that's the only. That's literally the only thing <laughs> we like, can do. I'm like, okay, so taking the batteries out means it's not sitting there using power. Well done, John. <laughs> right. No, yeah. I, I understand. And I'm, now. and I'm sure that the Lucera people will be like, yeah, well, you know, we had to pull this together pretty quickly because of COVID. Um, and I'm sure the next version of it will be reusable, but it's just there's so much waste in that, and yeah. you know, I don't know, it's annoying. So FDA approved. Wow. Yeah. I've never heard of yeah, this. Yeah, go get them. Yeah. They're really good tests. Yeah, no, I've I mean, they're about... that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if they're US only. I'm not sure if you can get them in. The, in I've England, but, I've um... certainly not heard of this thing, but uh, th- th- clearly, um, I mean, this is why you want to be in the Bay Area because there's actually loads of stuff there, which is great. That's actually really <laughs> good. I've never even heard of this. It's probably, you probably can't yeah. you probably can't have it here. Everyone's like, "What? You can have an electronic test? Goodness gracious me! We're still doing it by banging two rocks together." Um, I, I just got back from a conference and they tested us every day. What? They, these little... what who are they called? What are they called? 
Uh, I think they're called Lucira. L U C I R A is the name of the company. Check it. COVID nineteen yep. test. <laughs> Lucira, check yep. it. Okay. Uh, that, well, that's. I mean, the other reason. I, I mean, I would like to know anyway. But I feel like people listening to this might go. That sounds great. Where do we get this? Do you know where Emeryville is? Yeah, it's where their headquarters is. <laughs> They're in Emeryville? Yeah. <laughs> so it's about it's five miles ba- up the road from you, is it? It's basically Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, um, yeah. Yeah. They're not cheap. They're $75 a test. Um, 89 well, on Amazon. Crikey. So, okay. But, but you can uh, have one um, tomorrow. Cool. T- yeah. cool t- uh, and I'm encouraged to discover that the idea of um, uh, someone makes a test, which is uh, electronic and does a thing that actually works. Uh, is actually a good idea because my experience of this up to now has been pregnancy tests and Theranos. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> it's it is it is annoying that like a year and a half, two years into this thing, you still like you still can't go and get test test get a result within thirty minutes. Like generally for like you know five dollars or ten dollars, like because Amazon do test kits and you ship it off and they tell you within two days. Um, but like it, it's uh, that's a whole separate thing. Like I'm surprised that the testing isn't, given the fact that millions and millions of people around the world need to be tested. I'm surprised that this thing is still seventy five dollars a shot. You know, I, I don't, I don't know how long um, uh, the stuff takes here. Well, and it de- and it's very dependent on antigen tests and PCR tests. Like like I say, P- PCR tests are like the gold standard. Um, yeah, because yeah. antigen tests only show if you've got yeah symptoms. the la- the lateral flow ones. Yeah, yeah. All right. Anyway, we went from right to repair to right to not have COVID. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on. Also a right. (laughs) Did you guys see that? So last show we talked about Meta or Meter. We did. Um, um, Meta. (laughs) Meta. Your (laughs) Meta. So, John, my brother of true Meta. (laughs) (laughs) In Meta, we unite. Um, Did you see that they've announced a, a VR glove? Oh, yes. <laughs> this actually, I actually quite, I, this I actually, I think is quite cool, right? So as a bit of a summary of this, it's it's basically a glove with a bunch of tiny little um, um, air pumps on it. So it reacts to what you're doing in the virtual world. And then the idea here is that this, this array of little air things <clears throat> will help to provide kind of a, a a higher definition of of touch than the typical things that you get in like haptic feedback which is basically yeah. a rumbling device inside of a controller and this is the kind of shit that i love seeing because like I mean, this first iteration of it of course is not going to be very good like terrible. first iteration of everything um but it wouldn't surprise me if five years from now they'll, they'll be like saying, oh, the brand new, you know, uh, kind of glove VR or whatever they call it. Um, we now have 2000 air compressors on this and it keep going up and going up and going up and up as material science continues to grow. But what they were saying, I saw an interview with um, one of the people who's working on it and they were saying that kind of the test, the, 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 the main test that they're trying to get towards is where you could stroke a dog in VR and actually feel the fur. Yeah, which is really cool if they manage to pull that off. But they said there's all kinds of challenges around it, like different size hands. You need to be able to wash it, for example, which is important. Like, you know, this to me um, is is the oh, this is a staple of science fiction. This technology, right? Um, Yeah. Everyone who's ever talked about virtual worlds in detail has gone, okay, how do we, how do we replicate the sensation of touch? And it's basically you wear a glove which presses on your fingers in, um, ways controllable by software that makes it feel like you're picking up a thing, right? Yeah. Conceptually, it's not that hard a concept. Actually doing it quite is hard, supernaturally <laughs> difficult. And to, to me, it's, um, the th- the thing they've got, if you if you said to me, what would a prototype of it look like? It would look like this: the Nintendo Power Glove, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, the prototype um, in the article looks like ten years before the Power Glove. It's a glove connected yeah, to a true. thousand cables, connected to an array <laughs> of PCs. Yeah, I mean, it is. As far as I can tell, it is. Uh, I, we're still not really in a position where you can detect where someone's hand is very well, let alone. Um, yeah, you can. Uh, not- you can do that in VR. Not all that realistically, you can't. It's super realistic. They've Which, already got that. That's already been built. 
They only have it in Emeryville, oh, Eck. You don't know about it yet. Ah, you see, there it is. That's what it is, man. Uh, clearly, it's not in Bilston yet. <laughs> clearly not. It is not. No. Um, okay. Um, but yeah, they've the, already got so, the, the so, hand so, tracking the, thing. It's, yeah, yeah. So, there's the obviously the touch is way difficult. Yeah, this, so. this, this, this to me is in the same position that headsets are. That as we've said before, John, as you said repeatedly, um. VR becomes a thing when you can walk around with a pair of glasses like we're wearing right now. No one can tell they're not VR glasses, but you can see a VR projected world or AR projected stuff, which looks completely realistic. And at the moment, yeah, what exactly. you've got to do is wear yeah. a massive, great big motorcycle helmet, which is, I mean, now finally they're not wired anymore. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. you have to stand in the middle of um, a magic area delineated by posts, which detect where you're standing. <laughs> and right. Days, right. And, the distance we are from that big helmet to the invisible glasses <laughs> is <laughs> what are you nine for God's sake? Um, is the distance Sorry. that is the distance that, that the glove is from? Because uh, essentially, what you want to do is, I mean, fine, maybe you've got to put on a pair of gloves, but you'd want them to feel like just gloves you'd put on to just go out when it's cold, or surgeon's gloves, or something like that, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I imagine that when. when I mean, look, this happens all of the time with technology, right? It always, it gets better and better and better. I mean, Jeremy said this in the last show, if enough people care about it and there's enough money and people to work in it, then it will get figured out. Um, It wouldn't surprise me if in the future, these gloves will be paper thin. And you'll put them on and they'll, and they'll probably even have cooling systems built into them to stop sweating and things like that. I just think it's really, I like it when people try to build stuff like this because it's just, it's exciting. It's a good, it's a good moonshot. I, I think the problem is that everything, you know, 50 years from now, if these things exist and they're great, then the first iteration will look like this. Yes. But it's not at all clear to me that you can actually get there. I think this might not be doable, but. You never find out unless you try, and the first try will always look like this, regardless of whether it's doable or not. What do you think is not doable? I mean, obviously, one of the big challenges with this is is you can't, like, hard surfaces, this won't work with, you can't stop your hand moving forward in thin air, right? Like... It, it can only be it can yeah. only be touch it can only be the sensation of the touch yeah because to me it's not about being able to put your hand out and feel the sensation of a thing that you're touching you're not trying to replicate the sense of just touching your fingertip on a thing you're trying to reach out and pick a thing up and so yeah but, which which you can do currently but you want to be able to reach out and pick that thing up and feel like you've got it in your hand and see it in your hand with the glasses and I mean, I'm not saying it's theoretically impossible. It's not contradicted by physics or anything. I just think it might be too difficult to actually do. In the I same mean, way that you know, yeah, you know, like yeah. in Star Trek, um, someone gets cancer and Bones just walks up to the guy and goes on his neck and goes, "It was cured now." Right? That's good in yep. a, That's good on the telly, but I'm not sure that's actually doable. It's a good thing to aim for. We actually have someone in uh, in Emeryville who can do that. <laughs> you do, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have actually there's a clinic you can go to, uh, Doctor Doctor Nick. <laughs> I, I thought they were just famous for making Emery boards, but it turns out they actually do stuff. <laughs> no, they make villa as well. Uh, <laughs> wow, they're much better, uh, than, much better than Aston Villa, which is what we've got. Um, <laughs> right, so. I mean, to, to your point though, I, I mean, what? Obviously, I, I think all three of us are missing out on the science here but like there are just some things that like the the feel of a of dog fur um and the feel of a wet surface are completely different yeah. and i yes. just don't know if you can emulate like something that's wet for example with air yeah the, yeah, the, or, the, yeah or little things that move against or, your skin or, or, or little like, things move against your i mean this this is exactly my thought i I bounce Monday, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I feel like I shouldn't say things like this because I'm pissing on people's dreams, and it's a good thing. And you know, um, I'm 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 just adding stop energy to the process. But the rest of the time, if I go, I think this is a good idea. I feel like Peter Diamand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing. And, and going around, people going, "No, nah, everything will be solved by magical technology. Don't worry about it." You're like, "No, dude, the world's rubbish for a whole load of yeah. people. Stop saying it's going to be solved by." augmented but reality. hang on 
But dude, <laughs> look at look at this graph. It shows exponential development, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> that's that is one hundred percent accurate. <laughs> and this is the problem, right? So, and I honestly don't know how I feel. I think. It's not like I feel on average in the middle. I'm either Diamandis or I'm just Mr. Stop Energy and nothing in between. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we love you. That's why we love you. That's why, and that's why you, you have to be on podcasts. You have no choice about this. You know, nobody wants to listen to somebody who's moderate about these matters. <laughs> so well, we shall see. All right. Yes. What's next? Well, here's a fun one. I only, I only, only a brief thing, but nonetheless. So this is um, mostly Jono and I, rather than Jeremy. So let's see, but, is it more um, fun than the Spotify shuffle thing? Because... <laughs> hey, that sounds like one of those f- fake sex moves. <laughs> <laughs> Spotify shuffle, yeah. No, no, no. Um, uh, this is just um, a nice little thing that um, that we saw um, a while back. Jono and I designed a thing called Ubuntu Accomplishments, mm. which was a ah, way of um, yes. basically uh, gamifying. Uh, being part of the Ubuntu community. <laughs> so you get, yeah. uh, so it was a way of, um, giving people achievements for, uh, doing things as part of the community on ramp, which I learned about from reading the art of community. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, a, and, a double um, plug. Wow. Uh, I know. Oh, and, and, and keep it, going. Keep and, talking. And it was, um, uh, a lot of the underlying infrastructure was built around Ubuntu One because it's part of what I was working on time. And they also made a bunch of sense to do that, but that's not critical yep. to the process. The idea was that, um, it would lead you through the on-ramp of doing things like contributing to Ubuntu or joining Launchpad or learning how to use your desktop. And it would, it gamified that. And so, uh, Danny Llewellyn, she's, uh, basically rebuilt it. Uh, so it lives, breathes and jumps again. The, uh, the infrastructure, the technical infrastructure is different. Um, the, and, uh, she rebuilt the front, the front end. It's now in Flutter and Dart and all this kind of thing. And it's not using Ubuntu one on the back end. It's just got a daemon. But the point is that it still exists and the Ubuntu community team seem to be interested. And I just thought, wow, we built that and it lives again. Yeah. Unexpected. It's very cool. It's, it's very cool. I, 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 I'm, it'd be really cool to see it actually being like we, we did it. We built it. And then, you know, uh, we actually ended up having, I think it was like three or 4,000 people in the community using it. And wow. then when Ubuntu one got shuttered, um, it was going to be too much work to re- re-architect it, so it just kind of yeah. died to death. So I hope it actually sees the light of day, because I, I, the one thing I'm I'm proud of with that system is we got Ak and I, we talked for hours trying like designing it. Yeah, um, long time. And I think time. it was a thoughtfully designed system, because one thing that, uh, just very quickly, the one thing I learned about this, uh, which was very, I think, serves us to this day, um, is that uh, when you incentivize anything, Ideally, you want to focus on new skills. Don't focus on like, oh, you get a trophy for 10 bug reports or for 30 bug reports or whatever, because then people abuse the system. But if you're learning new skills, and that's how it was designed, was around the first time you submit a bug report, the first time you submit a pull request, the first time you join an event or speak at an event. You don't get extra credit for doing 30 of them. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I love, I love that. So yeah, very cool to see. Thank you. Yes. Goodbye, Danny. Accomplishments team. Excellent work. Fixing all that. Fixing all our shitty codes. <laughs> oh, I, no. I, I mean, it was quite gratifying to see that, um, as, as I say, the the, te- the technical infrastructure has been largely re-implemented from scratch, but the actual accomplishments are bas- basically embody a little program which checks whether you've done this thing, and they have gone on mostly unchanged. If you if you start the Ubuntu Accomplishments app now, and it shows you a list of trophies, and you click on one of them, and it says, Trophy created by John O'Bacon. Yeah. Yeah, you know, which is yeah, pretty, I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming, um, Danny, when she, um, when she went through this, she probably modernized a bunch of the code because we probably wrote it in you know, Python one or something, but yes, yeah. <laughs> um, God, but, uh, yeah, I, I just thought it was cool. <laughs> I have P- PTSD from wrestling with Twisted. <laughs> Dun- Duncan McGregor, wow. who worked on the Twisted team, fixed a bunch of that stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, nothing yeah. Like Twisted, still around. <laughs> yeah. Right. What's next? Uh, did you see that the FTC has said that the whole click to subscribe, having to call the cancel pattern is now under, they were very clear under current laws. This is, um, a clarification. So it didn't have to go through a bunch of approvals, uh, is def- definitely illegal, which I find, um, super good. I, this is one of the patterns that I can't stand. It's happened to me quite a few times. I would guess it has happened to, to both of you. Um, were you so, st- so to be clear here, this is companies saying, um, 
uh, where if you want to cancel the subscription or delete your account or whatever, you have to ring them up. Yes. Yeah. So to comply with the law, businesses must ensure signups are clear, consensual, and easy to cancel. Uh, spe- and specifically, businesses should provide cancellation mechanisms that are at least as easy to use as the method the consumer used to buy the product or service initially. So a, a very common pattern, and news organizations, unfortunately, tend to be the worst here, is you can easily, very easily click to subscribe. But then to cancel, you have to call. The queue is usually very long. They always try to talk you out of it. So it's mammothly difficult to cancel and one click to subscribe. So now if it's one click to subscribe, it has to be one click to unsubscribe, which is obviously great. It's such old school. It's such old world thinking, like the whole like call to unsubscribe. Like it's so stupid. what's, What's interesting to me is I think... There's, in some people's thinking, well, if we make it difficult to subscribe, unsubscribe, less people will unsubscribe and we'll make more revenue. When I actually don't think that's the case, the, uh, roughly the same amount of people will unsubscribe. I think you will get some that unsubscribe later or do subscribe a little bit longer, but will eventually get frustrated enough to do the thing. What I find with services that are super easy to unsubscribe is if I do unsubscribe for any reason, I'm very likely to then subscribe again. And the data actually backs this up about uh, one, uh, 30% of people recently subscribe to a service. If it's a hassle to yep. unsubscribe, I will 100% never subscribe to anything from that service ever again. Same here. So I think it actually impacts reg- revenue negatively while also being user hostile, which is about the worst oh. combination I can think of. Oh, well, I mean, so, uh, John, I don't think it's, well, sorry, it is old school, but I don't think it's done because it's old school. It's done purely because it's difficult. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm saying that, like, it, it, what, it, just to be very clear, what I'm saying is, I think the reason why companies do that is that some muppet probably thinks, yeah, if you make it really difficult to um, to unsubscribe, then people will just give up and you'll still 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 keep paying. Whereas a lot of the companies that I do business with, they explicitly state when they're selling you their products or service, they say you can unsubscribe with one click. Yeah, and that like, makes me more likely to want to subscribe I, to them. Right? I, I, the th- the thing it's so I, stupid. The yeah. thing I don't get, I genuinely don't understand this. Is you articulate that view that if you make it easy for people, they'll trust you more, they'll leave, and I one hundred percent agree with it. And everyone I've ever asked about this one hundred percent agree agrees with it. But I don't understand then why every company on earth aren't Zappos. Why doesn't everyone prioritize customer service? Because nobody does. People will not pay for customer service. They just won't. Everyone I, don't, I disagree with that. Zappos this. wouldn't have got to the revenue that they did if that was true. Yeah, but do they have as much? Re- do they have more revenue than the rest of the shoe industry who don't do this stuff? No, not at all. I, I don't know. Everybody talks about Zappos. To me, that's it's. I don't think they're as as, as unique sure. as people say they well, are. Well, okay, so I, so, are lot, so I would like you I to give co- me an example of another company who services customer service as much. I mean, Amazon is the best one I can come up with. I can give and you they're loads. Great. Most of the oh, companies I, I do customer business service, with. as much as I disagree with a lot of things Amazon does, their customer service is amazing continually. Every single time I use it, which is why they are one of the most valuable companies on earth. Yeah, that's that's exactly that's exactly why I mentioned them. So I think that's but, proof yeah. that people will pay for it. People don't use Amazon. Uh, easy. They're they're quick. They're not even inexpensive anymore because most times, if I do look around, things are cheaper elsewhere, and I still use Amazon. Yeah. It's quick, and it's I know convenient. if there's a problem, yeah. they will immediately fix the problem, and I'll pay more for that. Costco are a great example of great customer service. Even like smaller companies, like for example, I use a, a company called ConvertKit for email, and if I've got a question about anything, they've got that little. Little, I can see one right now on a different website, on the Kemper website, a little, that little speech bubble thing. I can go in there. I get a response to my queries within 24 hours. I think customer service now is like the trend. Yeah, agreed. You know, uh-huh. I mean, Zappos, to be clear, to, to support your point, Hack, they blazed the trail, right? Yeah. <laughs> they I, really I, I, did. I, and I wonder whether it's industry specific, because how's your ISP? Comcast, yeah, uh, but lack of choice and utilities the inf- impacts the the need to have to offer good customer no, service. No, no, I disagree with you because um, the UK is not the US. Plenty of choice here. It's not this. You, the whole area is one thing, and everyone here is also a hateful bastard who makes you wait uh, in, in the US. If you have three days. choices, that's a lot, and they're usually three yeah, vastly different choices. Yeah, we, we, we've got loads of. They're all the worst. Well, and, you know, I mean, look, there and, is obviously bad service out. And insurance out. companies well, and... Banks is different over here. 
a uh, service I've seen in, uh, admittedly, my experience of banks in, in England is obviously it's 14 years old, but uh, banks I, pro- over here I promise are, you they it, haven't got any better. Using insurance as an example, I pay here. more for my insurance than I could, and the service is impeccable every time. Yeah, And that's why really? I only use it, obviously, it's insurance, so I don't use it often, but when I use it, it's usually a stressful, aggravating time because something happened that you had to use your insurance, and they are unbelievably accommodating every single time. And I've been a customer for 20 plus years, paying mo- knowingly paying more than I could elsewhere, and will always be a customer because it, when something happens, I know it's sorted. Interesting. I, 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 with our bank, for example, we if I do, need we anything. We like a whole show on this. Yeah. Well, if I need anything from our bank, I text my banker. Like, <laughs> I've, I've got someone who, I, like, he, I set up my, I moved my corporate account over there for my business, and they didn't send me out there. They'd forgotten to send the cards out, or I didn't fill in the form or something like that. I texted him, and they arrived the following day. Okay. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, that, that is actually amazing. I, I, yeah. I, I, think, I think people want it. But yeah, now, now you put it that way, maybe maybe there are industries that don't care and industries that do care. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, and older, your point about like utilities and places like that. I, and I don't necessarily like, think it's just older things. I mean, try getting good customer service out of Google. Yeah, I mean, Google's good at a thing and customer service isn't that thing. Like they're very good at some things. And It's not even as if you can get bad customer service. You can't get any. You can't talk to anyone ever. That's brutal. Or get any feedback ever yeah. at any time. The only exception to that with Google is their ad business. Oh, I'm sure uh, that's G- fantastic. GCP <laughs> is a little bit different as well, but yeah. Anything oh, uh, consumer-facing yeah, is, is pretty brutal. Yeah. I, yes. I've, I've, I've not done enough GCP stuff to actually need to ask someone for help. I have with AWS, but not with GCP. The worst is Twitter. You report an account or tweets, it just goes into a black hole. <laughs> Completely or, useless. Or worse, talking utterly, to, utterly useless. Talking to people I know who um, have been incorrectly black holed, recovering from that, uh, getting them to difficult. pay attention to you and say is, is incredibly difficult. It's not as bad as Google, who are also inclined to ignore you. But if you get, you know, if you do a wrong thing on YouTube, maybe your email account goes away. Right. I think part of the thing I'm, I'm guessing here is because of the scale that things like YouTube and Twitter operate at, the, the automatic engineering response is you have to automate everything, and automating good customer service is probably not possible. Is impossible, yeah. yeah. Is impossible. That's the thing. I, uh, yeah, I very, very rarely have to report anyone on Twitter, um, but my clients often do. I have, um, oh man, I have to all the time. And it's, uh, and they just, and, and the one thing they always complain to me about is like, we just, there was no response beyond the, you, I think you go we, and like, we've successfully received your like report that. type of thing. Yes. Yeah. 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 We've yeah. Got, the yeah. Automated response is that, yeah. and that's all you, well, um, which is well, they, it's a hive of villainy. <laughs> they, they do, they do say, um, if, uh, if you report someone for, uh, some kind of decent reason and, that person eventually gets banned for that reason. They do come back to you and say, this person got banned and you contributed to that or whatever. So you get some, oh. I think that's their idea. Oh, they of having tell you some, that's better than yeah, the, most. Well, yeah, but the, 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 the point here is that you didn't know that because no one ever gets banned who you reported. <laughs> so, right. you know, but yeah, the, the, the Google thing, um, I'm told, I'm told PayPal are terrible if there's a problem. They're absolutely fine as long as there's not a problem. The instant something goes wrong, fixing it's a nightmare. I've had problems with PayPal in the past, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. I haven't had that problem myself. I, I have. have. To, <laughs> I have, I, I have to, um, block loads of people on Twitter because, um, <sighs> someone did some kind of crypto thing and mistagged some kind of other crypto thing as at SIL. Which means I not only oh, got CC'd no. on these... You are the new Solano? Only, it's not just that I got CC'd on that thread, but a whole bunch of people went, added that to... added my Twitter handle to their big list of crypto people we're going to tag into everything about crypto to get their attention Ooh. so maybe they'll retweet my coin thing so i can steal all the money or however it works i don't really understand it i know we're getting a, go- a bit long here but i have two funny crypto i mean they were in the serious section but they are both amusing 
Okay, let's T- let's tell, do tell it. Us the crypto thing. So I don't even know which one to start with. They're both so good. Uh, <laughs> let's start with the Constitution Dow. Did you see this one? Okay. Now, no. Um, you didn't see it at all. I don't no. know how okay. that's possible. Uh, right, what, right. What, what is the what is the Constitution now? Dow? Now, so bear with me. I, I'm interested in this because I saw this and I tried to read about it and I don't understand it. So I need you to explain to me. S- what happened? Because as far as I can tell, a bunch of crypto people took it in the shorts, which I'm basically okay with. Yeah, all so times. the ending is a little <laughs> bit hilarious. So a DAO, which is capital D-A-O, is a decentralized autonomous organization. So basically, it's a, a community of crypto folks get together and uh, divide up the organization and you get a token and that token gives you fractional something. And some it could be fractional ownership. Uh, in this case, they made very clear that it was not fractional ownership, but it was the uh, fractional right to decide what would happen. So a group got together and decided they were going to buy the only private exist- uh, a version of the U.S. Constitution in existence. There's 13 original copies. This is the only one in private hands. Wow, they- I didn't realize there was one in private hands. There is. Oh, yep. okay. So so first of all, I thought they were trying to buy the one in the National Archives. <laughs> no, no, no. There's, so that that's that's the original. And then there, there was 13 that went to the delegates and everything. There, this is one of those originals. Right, do carry on. <laughs> right. So, already fascinating. They raised $40 million. The estimate, the initial estimate was just over 20. So, they thought they had a legit, in fact, did have a legitimate chance to actually purchase again, the Constitution, which already again, I'm fascinated. Again, 40, yeah. 40 million actual dollars. Actual US dollars. No, 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 not 40 million stupid Dogecoin. No, so 40 people, million actual so how dollars. It worked was people would uh, send Ethereum, and then yeah. based on uh, a certain ratio, they would get one people token, and that people token would be one right to vote in what would happen. So as I said, you didn't okay. own one people token worth of the Constitution. You had one voting right, right for what they were, where they were going to display it, how long they would display it there, what other things they would do with it, et cetera. Okay. So it's basically, it's like, it's like a Linux foundation yes. project. And they were, the, the reason they called the people, the token people, because it was for the people and uh, all these things. What, what for, happened for, was... For the people who've got a million dollars worth a, of Ethereum. A billionaire said no and bought it. Uh, so Ken Griffin, <laughs> who's the started the hedge fund Citadel, uh, paid more, $43 million, I think was the final, uh, and bought it. And uh, it's actually... Uh, it's kind of funny. He's uh, allowing a free museum in Arkansas to display it for now, and I think he's going to move it around to different museums. So exactly what they said they were going to do, he just bought it with pocket change. He's a billionaire <laughs> and is doing that. So already the, – and the thing that's interesting if you follow crypto at all, Ken Griffin is one of the people that crypto and, and meme stock folks – hate. They hate Citadel because they do like front running and HFT and a bunch of things that we don't have time to explain here. But like when he shorts a company, GameStock as an example, people pile into it just to try to get him out of the money on his shorts. So the fact that it was him, I think is a little bit of a needle on his part. He certainly hasn't said that, but it almost has to be. Wow. Now, <laughs> what is even more comical here is now there's $40 million. And now, don't, to, for those of you who don't know how crypto and NFTs and all these things work, to buy, so that you had to buy uh, Ethereum. So let's say you use Coinbase, you want to donate $200. Uh, you probably on Coinbase would have spent about $8 to do that. You then had to send it to, uh, usually people use MetaMask, but any wallet, you have to have gas fee. Uh, gas fees are very high right now. So you probably spent, uh, somewhere, depending on what time of day you did it and how fast you wanted the transaction to clear, about 50 to $75 in gas fees. Okay. okay. So to donate that, you started with 200 bucks. You're already down to maybe 125, uh, some other things involved there. So let's say you end up donating about a hundred dollars and you lost about a hundred dollars already, but now you're in with the people token hundred bucks. They didn't get it. Now, if you want a refund, you have to unwind that. So you're going to lose the hundred dollars the other way. <laughs> so there's so people <laughs> that actually gas fees spiked for a little while, paid money to get their money back. So it would have cost them like two hundred and sixteen dollars <laughs> to not have donated a penny and got zero. Their refund ends up being negative two hundred sixteen bucks. Is <laughs> hilarious, and oh. because. My they didn't God. set any governance rules because they were basically like, we have three days to do this. Let's just just trust us. It's going to be great. There's no actual rules or governing body for how the tokens work now. So some people are saying, well, I'll just leave my token there. 
buy buy some other historical document where other people are say, like, what? I want my money back. <laughs> and so it's been a hilarious calamity. I'll send Ak a couple of links that you should definitely read if you want the full story because it is <laughs> yeah. unbelievably amusing. I will. I, I do put them in the put them in the document. And I'll put them in the show notes. Definitely, because I mean, presumably, um, that that what you should now be doing, Jeremy, is draw is very badly drawing a picture of a stupid cartoon monkey crying its eyes out, and then sell it to all of them for twenty million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably a great point to point out that there is still an NFT of the Bad Voltage logo with a misspelling because I was doing it at two in the morning. Uh, if you'd like to purchase it, I haven't looked in a while. It did have bids. <laughs> Uh, but if you want yeah, to how much what's how much did it go for? I, I, well, like, I, I never accepted an offer. I don't want to worry about the tax implications oh, okay. of that. I, it was at like two hundred fifty bucks at one point. What? Oh yeah. Wow. So if if we'd have taken that, would we now have like a billion dollars worth of Ethereum? <laughs> <or something? laughs> I, I will look again and, and uh, we'll put that in the show notes as well. A link yeah. and the current price uh, in, in the show notes as well. Although no matter what it goes to, I'm not accepting the bid. So what, whatever. <laughs> But that's, I don't even know if that's the funniest crypto story of the day. Oh, wait, what were you going to? I was just going to say, you say this now, Mr. No matter how high it goes, I won't take the bid, but you know, we'll see. I mean, if it goes to $300 million (laughs) and you each get a hundred million bucks, I'll take, I'll take the money. (laughs) (laughs) So did you see everything that's going on in El Salvador or do you have constitutional doubt questions because they're both so good? No, no, I have no questions. I just the, lols. The the El Salvador thing. Um, this one I I know a little bit about because I read into it and so on. But unfortunately, I got as far as the word hyper Bitcoinization. One of my favorite words. I'd never heard it before yesterday, but excellent. <laughs> At this point, I just have to object on, like, I don't know, philological grounds or something. (laughs) So this is a real Bloomberg article that went on the terminal. El Salvador government strikes deal with Bitfinex Blockstream uh, to issue $1 billion Bitcoin bond. Totally innocuous headline. And then you get to the first sentence in the article, and it's so, so good. So, and this is directly from Bloomberg. The country is set to issue so-called Bitcoin bonds to, quote, accelerate hyper-Bitcoinization and bring about a new financial system on top of Bitcoin. El Salvador could issue $1 billion worth of Bitcoin bonds via Blockstream's liquid network. The proceeds of the bond issuance could support the development of volcano-powered Bitcoin mining. And this is a quote from the, the Blockstream folks releasing it. This bond offering is something we think will be attractive to a wide range of investors, ranging from cryptocurrency investors, investors seeking yield, holders, and ordinary people. So, I mean, you have everything here. You have hyper-Bitcoinization, volcano-powered Bitcoin mining, holders, and a press <laughs> release. Like, this is amazing. They're calling it, they're calling it the volcano bond. And I just, it, it, it's, such an amazing story. Uh, but to get into the little bit of the details, because unfortunately for me, I, I did actually see what th- what this was. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Bef- bef- okay. Before you get into the detail, I feel I ought to point out that the thing they're talking about building, they're calling it Bitcoin City. Oh, yeah. They are calling it Bitcoin City. <laughs> so this- it will be circular with an airport and will feature a central plaza designed to look like a Bitcoin symbol from the air, said Mr. Bukili, a tech-savvy 40-year-old who in September proclaimed himself dictator, in quotes, of El Salvador on Twitter in an apparent joke. Which is, is not joking. The whole situation there is scary. <laughs> yes. That's a different show. Uh, so this, this volcano bond is a $1 billion bond denominated in real actual US dollars with a 10-year maturity, uh, pays 6.5% annual interest, uh, and El Salvador will invest the first half in infrastructure. So the first $500 million, totally normal thing to do. Improve your infrastructure. Very good. Now the rest, they're going to put directly into Bitcoin. They'll yeah. hold those Bitcoins for five years and then sell them over the remaining five years. If it makes any money on those sales, 50% of the investment will, will go back to pay themselves. 50% will go to you. So you're, you're I, I don't understand what you're exactly investing in here besides lol. This is a volcano bond. If you think Bitcoin's <laughs> going to go up, invest in Bitcoin, you get the whole upside. Uh, if you think it's going to go down, you wouldn't want this anyway. But my favorite, maybe favorite part, because there's so much to like here. Blocks, and this is another quote from Bloomberg. Blockstream models show at the end of the 10th year of the bond, the annual percentage yield they estimate will be 146%. Remember, the annual uh, interest is actually 6.5% due to Bitcoin's pro- projected appreciation, which their uh, chief strategy officer estimates uh, will be at least $1 million within the next five years. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
which he put in a press release. <laughs> the whole thing is amazing. This is this is bonkers. Qu- qu- yeah, quoting um, qu- quoting someone who is uh, the chief strategy officer, whose name is Samson Mo. Which yes, I he's the one that said it. that. That's uh, such a wicked name. <laughs> he, he, yeah, <laughs> he said the game theory in quotes on the bonds gave the first issuer El Salvador an advantage. If Bitcoin at the five-year mark reaches a million dollars, which I think it will, they'll sell Bitcoin in two quarters and recoup that five hundred million. <laughs> it's, I mean. I uh, the 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 constitution thing I didn't understand even what the plan was this I just don't understand all the financial bollocks written all the way I'm assuming actual finance people haven't commented on this because they're too busy falling off their chairs laughing no, right? actual finance people this is from Bloomberg it's you know this is uh, um the okay thing I find madding, maddening about this whole situation is years ago when crypto was first a thing when we first started talking about Bitcoin, I found it incredibly confusing to figure it all out. And normally, with everything else in life, the more you learn about it, the easier it becomes to understand. Not with crypto. No. It continues to become more and more confusing as all of these... I'm not, I was going to say insane people, but just... Toddlers. Just these people. <laughs> Just like push it to all these new levels. I just don't, I just don't get it. And I never will get it. I will leave this planet confused. This is as similar to me as NFTs is you have a bunch of people who made unbelievable amounts of money in crypto because they bought Bitcoin at a penny or mined it when it was mineable, not even on GPUs, but on CPUs, who now legitimately have hundreds of millions of dollars in, in Bitcoin. Can't really sell yeah. it easily, as was proven recently. Someone tried to sell a fair amount, and it t- tanked the price pretty quickly. So, getting any reasonable amount out quickly is is not feasible. So, oh, what well, you can if, do if you sell a big amount yourself, it, it uh, the price drops quickly enough to screw up the, your own selling. It doesn't screw up for other people; it screws up for the second half of your own money. Yes, because the oh, transactions well, take sucks. a while. Well, it's not, <laughs> if you wanted to sell a billion dollars versus Bitcoin, you realistically couldn't in, in any reasonable time frame. Right now, that will okay. likely change. Um, but what you can do with it is a bunch of goofy things like volcano bonds and NFTs and everything else where you like you got $100 million, you can't spend it anyway. Lol, buy a, whatever the ape that just went for a hundred grand was. This is the annoying crypto bro version of rock stars building themselves guitar shaped swimming pools or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or or drilling um you know, or, or you know drilling a big hole in between Los Angeles and San Francisco and putting trains in it. You know what? Anything is possible, right? <laughs> Volcano powered Bitcoin mining. Dollar Tree isn't selling items for a dollar anymore. I don't know what to believe. So okay. you should end this by noting that if you do want to invest, you can do so at a minimum of one hundred dollars, and they're currently taking dollars, tether, uh, or or of course Bitcoin. So get get on the list. However, I mean, and to be clear, this is not financial advice because I'm not a financial advisor. But for God's sake, don't get involved in this. Just walk a thousand miles away from it immediately, please. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Do, do we want to end on a less crypto-y? Uh, or is this a good time? To <laughs> we should probably wrap it up. We're we're pretty much out of time. Um, yes. Ah, I, well, let's end on this. I have okay. a suggestion. Yes. So before we started recording, we were talking about we're coming up to the, you know the uh, the most wonderful time of the year, mm-hmm. which you may believe is Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever, however you celebrate the end of the year. But for us, it is reviewing our bad voltage predictions <laughs> and coming up with new ones. Um, this is the most wonderful time of the year because I will be right about everything, of course, as usual. Um, but I would love to see your ideas for predictions. Pop them into the community. Like we, we, we all need food for thought on the Bad Voltage team. So start sharing some of your ideas for things that we might want to consider to pick as predictions. I yeah. think that'd be quite cool. That, that, that's actually interesting. I need to go back and um, look at the last one and review. I should be very interested to see because I don't think any of us actually remember what we said. <laughs> no, ago. absolutely not. Not at all. So I, I want to see whether this is for the first year Jono didn't predict the Facebook VR thing, at which point they went all in on VR. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be great. The one who I didn't predict I- it, that they would just even change the whole name of the organization to be VR focused <laughs> would be a little bit funny. If that happened, I 
I'm gonna have a midlife crisis. I'll, ta- okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. What, what, I'm ho- what I, I'm hoping two things about the predictions. I'm hoping that you didn't predict the Facebook VR thing for the first time in recorded history, and that in between now and the end of the year, Microsoft buy Canonical. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're going to see that Ubuntu accomplishments are back and think we have to have it. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's going to be what it is. It's going to be an accomplishment that says bought canonical and Satch is the only person who's got it. <laughs> <laughs> and, then it and then it disappears off of Mark's desktop and just goes shmung. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and on that bombshell. Uh, and on, and that, on bombshell. that bombshell. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for, for, for listening. Um, go to the community go check us out go share your thoughts predictions whatever we'll see you on the other side recording Re record when the crowd say bow selector. Re re re. <laughs> Did you see someone um, edited the Wikipedia page for um, Craig David or something? Craig David, <laughs> and it said um, uh, surprisingly, David took a break from his music career to work with the um, British Olympic team in 2016. Uh, um, he was working with the archery team as the bow selector. <laughs> 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 I, I think it lasted on Wikipedia about 30 seconds before it got redacted. This, this will make, this will make no sense to you, Jeremy. But that is, that is hilarious. I thought it was good. Wasn't it? I laughed at that. <laughs> this is a very, very British specific joke. This one. <laughs> Isn't there a show called Post Selector? Which, exactly. That's where the joke yeah. comes okay, so from. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was it. I got it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so we're right. still recording here, by the way. Yes, <laughs> we are, yes. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Thank you, Marius. Um, all right. Hang on, my microphone condom's falling off. Yeah, mine oh, ripped. Yeah. It's uh, terrible. Oh. Yours is ripped. Do a test. Oh, ripped. <laughs> <laughs> just supposed tip. to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's, just yeah, a, it's just a tip. <laughs> yours is also. And that's, when I was a kid, I thought condoms were that, just like a little kind of hat that sat on the end of your dick. <laughs> I'm serious. I, uh, for once in my life, legitimately have no response. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, don't know what to do I was quite that. surprised when I discovered that, no, it actually kind of wraps around it. I'll, t- it, I'll tell you what. Wrap. And you won't be as surprised as you will be when you find that Marius puts that bit before the music. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I suspect that this may be the case. <laughs> no, Ma- Marius, please don't put, don't put that before the music or we'll just get banned from loads of places. <laughs> Sponsored by Durex. All right, here we go. <clears throat> One, two, three, three, three four, four, five, five, five six, 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 seven, seven, seven eight, 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 nine, nine ten. ten.